Hello, and thank you for all joining us for our new webinar series, Visual DX Academy Master Educational Program. I'm Dr. Art Papier, the CEO and co-founder of Visual DX. Over the next several months, we're excited to bring you excellence in educational programming with the help of our sponsor, Janssen. Today, Dr. Stephen Chen will focus on variations in presentations of dermatologic disorders. Before I introduce Dr. Chen, I'd like to take a moment to go through the agenda for the next hour. After Dr. Chen's presentation, we'll have time for Q&A, so please make sure to submit your questions in the panel. This webinar is being recorded and will be available right here on the visualdxacademy.com. We also welcome you to not only review the recording, but also download our complimentary educational materials. We will also test your knowledge of today's presentation with an interactive quiz via Kahoot. And the winner will be getting a prize, so you wanna stick around for that. Okay, without further ado, let me introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Stephen Chen. Dr. Chen is a board certified internist and dermatologist at Mass General Brigham. There he serves as vice chief of education in the Department of Dermatology, He's also an assistant professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School. His clinical interests include cutaneous lymphomas, complex medical dermatology, oncodermatology, inpatient dermatology, and medical education. We're thrilled to have Steve today discussing variations and presentations of dermatologic disorders. Dr. Chen. Great. Thank you so much, Art, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you for having me today for your uh, Visual DX Academy talk on variations and presentations of dermatologic disorders. I'm excited to be here. Um, first of all, the disclosure, uh, I have received honoraria from Pfizer and Novartis for serving on a digital media advisory board, which is unrelated to the talk that I'll be giving today. So by the end of the talk, what I hope everyone can walk away with is the ability to describe disease variation in dermatologic diseases and to recognize them when they present quote unquote atypically. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. To define the most important cognitive biases such as premature closure and representative bias and be able to summarize how these biases lead to errors and to know and understand the typical and atypical presentations of skin disorders in the immunocompromised patient. But I'm gonna turn this on its head just a little bit with the next slide. And that is that I would like us to acknowledge that even by using these terms, we, we are already potentially leaning into our biases for how things quote unquote should present. So for example, in my mind, the idea of needing a skin of, color, skin of color curriculum because it is not the typical is inherently biased because it implies that skin disease in darker skin tones is the atypical, which I don't think is true. Instead, I think we need to come up with another mindset such as the common versus the uncommon, the likely versus the less likely. At the end of the day, I think it's important for us to realize that there's just, we have to be ready to take care of all comers that come to see us. So instead of focusing on typical versus atypical, I wanna think a little bit more about how, what might affect something to present clinically and the different ways that it might present. And I've split this up into four main categories of how it might affect skin disease. The first is host factors, and this is, for example, underlying skin tone, a patient's immune status, and genetic differences for that particular patient. The second would be environmental factors, and I use that in a very broad sense of the word, but for example, occupational exposures, lifestyle differences, and even perhaps things that we are applying ourselves to the skin, either with or without doctor's instructions. The third would be geographic factors. We know that there are different rates of disease per capita, and we also know that climate plays a large role in terms of where we see potential diseases. Finally, disease factors. There are inherent disease characteristics that we have to keep in mind, and there are certain subtypes of disease that always are going to look a little bit uh, less common than what we typically see, the uncommon variants, and we have to be ready to recognize all of those. So let's start with host factors. In terms of thinking about host factors, one very big one is whether the patient is immunosuppressed. This could be iatrogenically after a transplant where we are the ones that are actually providing the uh, immunosuppression, or perhaps it's part of a disease process such as HIV. Secondly, under host factors, I think underlying skin tone, of course, is a, important to remember, and that erythema may appear more violaceous or hyperpigmented in patients that have more melanated skin. And additionally, it's important to remember that the rest of the exam tends to stay the same. 
And then finally, genetic predispositions. There are different likelihoods to have certain diseases, and then all certainly certain different genetic predispositions may change the severity of disease when it does come up. In terms of environmental factors, occupational exposures like contact dermatitis that's more prevalent in certain professions comes to mind. Exposures and habits at home, such as humidity, the presence and absence of allergens is another example. And then finally, lifestyle differences like hygiene practices, our hobbies, our activities, our exposure to UV, sunscreen equipment, and also importantly, medications. Geographic factors in terms of thinking about climate, I think a great example of this is Chagas disease. Unfortunately, as we see climate change in the current state of the world, we're seeing Chagas more and more commonly in northern climates. Lyme disease is another that where um, we're seeing that kind of spread as climate changes as well. And population level prevalence is different for different diseases. So for example, mycosis fungoides is more prevalent in the Scandinavian countries and pemphigus is more prevalent in India where there's something called the pemphigus belt. Um, so it's important to think about where the patient might be from as well. And finally, disease factors. So for example, all the group, the group of skin diseases that are caused by checkpoint inhibitors are called the immune-related adverse events or dermatologic immune-related adverse events. We often joke that ICIs or checkpoint inhibitors quote unquote cause dermatology because it can cause anything. So we really have to be ready to see anything after a patient gets a checkpoint inhibitor. Perineous plastic triggers and drug-induced eruptions are good examples of where a skin eruption may present with multiple morphologies at the same time. And as an example, syphilis and sarcoid are both great examples that we always teach can present in a variety of ways. So let's start going through some cases. So for case one, we see in this uh, patient, many of these little white bumps. And if we wanna get more dermatologic about it, you can start to see a lot of these, what would be pustules. Um, and again, whenever we see someone who has a un darker underlying skin tone, we have to be really cognizant of the fact that there may be erythema that we're not really noticing. So this would be what we, what I might term the more uncommon presentation. Um, and this is the patient's history. A 32 year old gentleman with a new rash two days after uh, being in the OR for knee replacement surgery. It's itchy and then otherwise asymptomatic. So I'll pause a second and let everyone kind of think about what they think this diagnosis might be. Um, but I'll show you kind of the other variant of this, which would be this. On a patient with more lightly pigmented skin, you can start to see that there are a lot of these studded pustules. Some of them may actually start to coalesce, um, but otherwise there's this background of erythema. So this is a case of AGEP or acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis. This Diagnosis occurs generally one to two days after exposure to drug. You only need one exposure, unlike the other types of uh, type four hypersensitivity reactions. This one, just one dose is enough to elicit this reaction. I always remind people not to forget about perioperative antibiotics because of just that one dose that's necessary. And for me, the treatment is usually topical steroids, but I'll start systemic steroids if necessary, especially if the patient has systemic symptoms or has lab abnormalities that are found. When we compare these two different uh, pictures, both of AGEP, it's very clear that the host factor here of underlying skin tone completely changes the exam. And it's only by practice and by really cluing ourselves into the need to look for erythema and to look for inflammation that we start to see that they're actually quite similar in terms of the studded pustules on top of an inflamed background. Other examples where skin tone, I mean, there's tons of examples out there, but other another example of how skin tone really changes the exam. Here we see a targetoid eruption, certainly much more prevalent on the, much more noticeable, the central erythema on the right-hand side. On the left, it almost looks like there's central clearing, but this was a diagnosis, or this is a diagnosis of erythema chronica migrans from Lyme disease. All right, I'm gonna move on to case two. So here on the bilateral soles and uh, heading up the, the sides of the foot, probably up across the lateral malleoli um, and also onto the toes, you see this quite this kind of scale crust almost really scaling uh, that looks quite adherent, but you also have these areas, focal areas of sparing as well. So this is a 44 year old gentleman with a pruritic eruption for months. The patient has been on high-ish high doses of prednisone for months for his recent diagnosis of polymyalgia rheumatica. 
And so I'll pause here and just kind of let people think about what might be going on here. I think there's a lot of things that we could think about here. Anytime you see something that looks paculosquamous, especially on the acral surfaces, we're thinking about things like psoriasis. But the thing here is that if this patient's been on highish doses of prednisone, it should really change how we were thinking about this case. So this is what the common presentation might look like. And you can see that there's perhaps excoriation. Um, and perhaps if I can point out in the interweb spaces, um, some red papules with perhaps some linear burrows on top. And of course, if you did a scraping, this is what you find under the microscope. This is, of course, our good friend, the scabies mite. So the original picture that I showed you of that scaling on the foot, those that's basically crusted scabies um, or a scabies infestation or an infestation of Sarcoptes scabii. So the crusted variant usually happens in immunocompromised individuals. And this is actually a pretty common story that I've seen in my clinical practice where the patient gets immunocompromised because of a medical condition. In fact, I've also seen people who've gotten scabies, who had scabies, became immunocompromised because a dermatologist started immunosuppression for that original rash, and then they turned into having the crusted variant. So there's nothing different about the mite itself. It's the exact same mite between the crusted variant and the normal variant. Variant. Yeah. In the crusted variant, it's very, very contagious. Each patient with crusted scabies is estimated to have over a million mites. I have no idea how they did that calculation. Um, and then each patient that has normal scabies is estimated to have between 10 to 20 mites at any given time. Again, don't know who did that study. Um, not something that I personally would do as a researcher. The important thing for crusted scabies would be to treat for permethrin and ivermectin, just because these patients often can stay infected, their burden of disease is just so high. Um, and so while for regular scabies, we might just treat with permethrin for a couple times a week apart, um, for crusted scabies, we're adding in the PO dose most frequently. So this is another example of host factors. And this it's interesting because for this particular example, the host factor of immunosuppression was really iatrogenically caused. And so it's important to remember that immunosuppression of any kind can really change the morphology of a particular eruption. I think here's another great example how immunosuppression can play a role. On the right, I think we see this a lot in clinic day after day. This is a, a rather straightforward example of seborrheic dermatitis. But on the left-hand side, we can see that this is sebderm, but just kind of gone wild because on the left-hand side, this patient has HIV and is immunosuppressed. So just in another example that in the state of immunosuppression, we really have to be careful because things can really look a little bit different than what we're used to seeing. Looking at case three here on the hand, um, you can see that there are these erythematous papules that really line up at the base of the thumb. It starts to extend up here onto the MCPs and perhaps onto the fingers as well. Some of them look a little deeper seated, perhaps a little bit nodular. So this is an itchy eruption on the hand. This particular patient saw another physician who started triumphant alone. Um, it helped at first, but then it started to get a lot worse and it started to spread and it started to get a lot itchier. So I think this is another example of where we should pause and say, how might this have looked without topical steroids. And so this would be a good example of how that same eruption might've looked before topical steroids were applied. And if you look here, you can start to see that there's a little bit more scale here across many of these erythematous plaques and papules, which we're really missing here. There's really no sense of scale. And these lesions look a lot deeper, almost nodular as opposed to plaque-like. Well, as you probably have guessed, this is a case of tinea incognito. So tinea incognito is just regular old tinea, normal tinea, usually corporis, depending on where on the body this is. This is an example of tinea fasciae, but then it's been treated with topical steroids. And for that reason, you've lost the typical morphology for that exam. So it changes in clinical appearance with these deeper, sometimes more nodular lesions, and often you lose scale. What's really helpful here, though, is that you still see that annular appearance here on the face. And if we go back to the original example, you can also see that if you look at it and maybe squint, you can make out that it's a little bit annular as well. But it's important always to have a high index of suspicion, especially for fungal processes, um, because this has tricked many a dermatologist. And it's important to think about how things might change after we've had our chance at treating them. And like I mentioned, the configuration usually stays the same. 
So when we compare this side by side, we can see that this is a mixture of host factors and environmental factors. Host factors meaning what are our, what are our, um, our habits or environmental factors, what are our habits, what are we putting on the skin? Um, or perhaps the patient could be immunocompromised as well from prednisone that could also change the exam too. The important point I wanna make is that the different factors I've kind of laid out at the beginning can combine. You don't have to just have one. It's important to think about all of these when we think about different variations in clinical presentation. In case four, this uh, particular case that we're looking at, you can already start to see these small punctate erosions on uh, in the mouth, also including the tongue, also on the lips uh, at the corners of the mouth as well. Notably, there's some sparing of the gingiva, the, the area of the gums just next to the teeth. So this is a 63 year old gentleman with new erosions in the mouth, no skin findings elsewhere. Um, there's really no skin lesions. So I would pause for a second and kind of think about what this differential might be. Um, for those of us who see this in clinic, if we only saw this, there was no other skin lesions. I think many of us would start to think about, could this be herpetic? Is this something that needs to have um, a viral swab to make that diagnosis? Could this be something different? Like, could this be aphthous ulcers? Could this be Bichette's in the right type of patient? Um, but the differential is quite broad. Well, let us let me show you what we might commonly see um, when it's not in the mouth. So in this case, we're starting to see these arcuate or annular tense bulla um, uh, that's really kind of spread out all over the back and the obviously the left upper arm there. You can also see some post-inflammatory pigment alteration as well across the back where prior lesions might have been. And if you were to push down on these bulla, you would certainly see that they are Nikolsky negative, which would make sense when you combine that with the tense. So it's interesting because if I just showed you this picture, I think you would have a very different different uh, you would have a very different differential diagnosis compared to this photo. And I think that's the point that we're trying to drive home here, which is that these are the same disease processes. So if we use the quote unquote typical or the more common presentation, you might come up with a diagnosis of an autoimmune blistering disorder. When you're thinking about the tense and the Nikolsky negative group, you're thinking in the pemphigoid group. A nice mnemonic that I like to teach my med students and my residents is that pemphigoid ends with D, so it's deep. So that's in the hemidesmosome. So you're thinking about things like bullous pemphigoid, linear IgA, the um, uh, everything that's kind of in the deeper, like epidermolysis bullosa acquisita uh, bullus lupus versus pemphigus, which ends with an S for superficial. So there you're seeing things like pemphigus vulgaris, foliaceous, perineoplastic pemphigus instead. So this is a case of bullus pemphigoid. And you say, wait, I thought bullus pemphigoid doesn't usually go to the mouth. And you're right. However, there was this nice paper that came out in JAMA Dermatology a couple of years ago that found that 17% of patients, um, a total of 328, had mucosal symptoms associated with more refractory disease. The important point I want to make here is that we often are taught that bullous pemphigoid doesn't go to the mouth and mucous membrane pemphigoid goes to the mouth instead, but really it can affect bullous pemphigoid too. And I think this is a great example of two things, one of host factors and two of potentially some disease factors as well. Um, so if in the paper that I just cited, they found that uh, patients who had more who are more likely to have mucosal lesions were less likely to have eosinophilia on their CBC with differential. They were harder to treat. And there was a trend, although not statistically significant, to have, see more oral lesions if the case was thought to be induced by DPP-4 inhibitors. Those would be gliptins that are used for diabetes. So just a great example, again, of multiple factors coming together to potentially change how a patient might present with this particular disease process. Um, I'll just also put in a plug here too, to mention, even though we might talk about it in a little bit, checkpoint inhibitors are known to cause bullous pemphigoid as well. And that's another great place where we see that the type of bullous pemphigoid that actually occurs after checkpoint inhibition is different from the classic kind of bullous pemphigoid that we see. We actually published a nice paper on this three years ago. And what we found is that patients who got bullous pemphigoid from checkpoint inhibitors also are more recalcitrant to treatment. They are more likely to present much later after getting their checkpoint inhibitor than after getting a, another drug-induced bullous pemphigoid. Most drug-induced bullous pemphigoid presents within six months. The median time to onset of lesions for our patients after checkpoint inhibitor was 8.9 months. 
And those patients had more, were more likely to have an eosinophilia um, and again, required more stronger, more immunosuppression for treatment. Just to point to no, just another point um, that it's important to keep up on the literature, because as you can see here, um, there are nuances to all these different triggers, nuances to all these different presentations, even for one disease like bullous pemphigoid. All right, let's move on to case five. Unfortunately, I think you guys are getting kind of a, a particular view of skin disease. I happen to direct the autoimmune blistering clinic and the lymphoma clinic. And so for that reason, I apologize. You're getting a lot of uh, my, my kind of interest. So for this case five, we're gonna start with history. I'm gonna start by giving you the diagnosis. Um, and I'll leave this in by saying that uh, this is something that I see every week. A 50-ish uh, year old person with slightly pruritic patches over the course of months to years comes to see you. A biopsy shows epidermotropism of atypical lymphocytes and tagging of the derma epidermal junction. So if you read that kind of line of, of text for dermatopathology that should set off some alarms for what you think this particular diagnosis might be. This is a case of mycosis fungoides. As a reminder, mycosis fungoides is the most common of the cutaneous lymphomas. It happens in uh, out of the cutaneous lymphomas where there's about 2,500 cases a year, mycosis fungoides makes up about 44% of those cases. It's generally a very indolent process. It's a type of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, um, but there's many variants, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. So this is what we call the quote unquote classic or common presentation. You see these sometimes atrophic, thin erythematous plaques with fine scale. It's usually distributed across the bathing suit distribution. So basically where the sun doesn't shine. So on the buttocks, the lower flanks, um, kind of in the inguinal regions on the upper thighs, that's the classic distribution and the classic appearance and presentation for mycosis fungoides. This type of presentation instead is the hypopigmented variant of mycosis fungoides. So here instead, first of all, in a patient that has an underlying darker skin tone, because we know that hypopigmented MF happens more frequently in this population, but I would just highlight here that anytime you see a difference in pigmentation, one important question, if it's not um, already, if it's not apparently obvious when you see the patient is, trying to figure out what original skin tone was and what disease skin tone looks like. Is it the lighter patches that are the uh, new um, change or are the darker patches the ones that are new? And so an important point I'd also highlight here is that just because hypopigmented MF is more common in patients with darker skin, it does not mean that patients with darker skin only get hypopigmented MF. They can still get regular MF, regular kind of the erythematous, um, inflammatory thin plaque on the bathing suit distribution. So just to know though, that the hypopigmented variant happens more frequently. And I actually think that this is a very interesting diagnosis, clinically speaking, in terms of clinical morphology. The reason for that is because the differential here is relatively short. You can think about post-inflammatory hypopigmentation. You can think about vitiligo, but as many of you can see, this does not look depigmented. This looks hypopigmented. We can think about other things like mac uh, um, progressive macular hypomelanosis. That usually happens more so on the lower back. Um, and also finally, tinea versicolor is the one that we often see presumptively treated before a patient comes in with a diagnosis of MF in this presentation. One thing that really helps here is that the actual lesion is um, the way that it was described to me is imagine someone took some mud, threw it against a wall, and then let it kind of drip down. And that fuzzy edge, the way that it kind of looks feathery on the edge um, is very classic for hypopigmented mycosis fungoides. And of course, you might you would have to do a biopsy to make a diagnosis of MF. But at the same time, I also understand why a lot of people try to treat the other diseases because they're more common. So it's just important to keep that broad differential in your mind. This is a case of MF, but in the tumor stage. So now that we're seeing it get a lot bigger and a lot thicker, we're advancing now in stage. Tumor stage means that you have 2B stage of mycosis fungoides or cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And importantly, the, um, this means that this patient's upstaged and this patient has to potentially consider more systemic therapy as opposed to just skin-directed therapy, depending on the rest of the skin exam. So in terms of going back to how might something affect the presentation clinically, let's use MF as a prototypical example. Those are the four factors that we talked about. If we think about host factors here, 
Hypopigmented MF in patients with darker skin tone is a great example of how that host factor is going to change how we kind of approach the disease because we know that it's more common in this population. When we think about environmental factors, there's reports of potential associations of mycosis fungoides with certain exposures. So personally, I don't know of anything super definitive. However, I will just say, for example, the VA actually allows for patients who um, were exposed to Agent Orange actually claim this as, um, as a reason for benefits from the VA. And so there are some links of Agent Orange with lymphoma, <clears throat> in general. And so this being a lymphoma, there's some conjecture as to whether that could be playing a role. In terms of geographic factors, we are more likely to see MF in certain regions like the Scandinavian countries. And so perhaps it's a mixture of these. Maybe it's an environmental factor because of the geographic factor, or maybe it's a genetic predisposition, which would be a combination of host factors with geographic factors. And finally, disease factors. There's so many different subtypes of this disease that can exist. We've talked about the hypopigmented variant. We've talked about the classic variant. You have to think about things like Warringer Collop, which is just a solitary lesion. You can think about how quickly it presents. Large cell transformation also makes a lot more tumors um, in terms of how quickly it can progress. You can think about granuloma slack skin. And then if you want to include all the other atypical presentations like parasoriasis, digitate dermatosis, there's a lot of things that fit into this category under the atypical lymphocytic infiltrate category that we really have to think about. All right, case six. So here on, or these are the ankles, the lower legs and the ankles of a particular patient. You can tell that they're very, very, crusted, if this is how they usually start down here with that pink nodule on the left ankle there, um, and then they start to ulcerate um, and then certainly have that rim of erythema around the necrotic eschar that's in the middle. So if you just saw this, you might think that these are eruptive keratoacanthomas, which is something that we used to see a lot more frequently when our metastatic melanoma patients were put on BRAF inhibitors, but without a MEK inhibitor. When you just have a BRAF inhibitor, you start to push your pathway through CRAF, which, um, which basically promotes skin cancer formation or squamous cell carcinoma formation, which is why we see the eruptive KAs with BRAF inhibition. We found that if you add a MEK inhibitor, you don't really see that as much. So that was something that I used to see a lot more during residency about 10 years ago. But now that we've learned that, we don't see eruptive KAs quite so frequently. Instead, this patient had metastatic, or excuse me, um, had a T-cell lymphoma on pembrolizumab and developed these lesions after four months of therapy. So this was originally treated as eruptive keratoacanthomas. They were cut out. Some of them were injected with 5-FU. Um, but let me show you kind of the other, the more common appearance of what we're talking about here. And this would be a great example of what we're seeing. So on the posterior lower legs of this particular individual, you're starting to see these erythematous pink plaques, maybe some central ulceration, some central erosion, um, and some hemorrhagic crusting as well. But all these lesions are relatively discrete. And so um, I'll pause and let people think a little bit about what they think this might be, both the kind of uncommon presentation that I showed you at the beginning and the more common here. Um, so this is actually a lichenoid eruption that's caused from checkpoint inhibitors. So here, this is just a lichenoid drug eruption on this photo here. So immune checkpoint inhibitors, I'm sure I'm, um, I, I'm saying something totally obvious here, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. They work by basically blocking these immune checkpoints that usually are helpful in inducing some immune tolerance. But by blocking these checkpoints, we're releasing the brakes, we're allowing the immune system to basically start to target antigens in a very specific way for the hope of fighting cancer. The problem is that um, obviously if you fight cancer in that way, you're also potentially going to fight normal tissue in that way too. And as I mentioned before, adverse events to immune checkpoint inhibitors are collectively called immune-related adverse events or the IRAEs. There is variability in presentation though, and that's based on the checkpoint inhibitor or the cancer type. So for example, I know that if a patient gets um, ipilimumab, which is blocking CTLA-4, they are more likely to get a skin CRA or a cutaneous IRAE compared to patients who get pembrolizumab or nivolumab where they're blocking PD-1. Additionally, I know that if I'm treating a patient with metastatic melanoma, they're also more likely to get an ERA when compared to patients that I'm treating for non-small cell lung cancer. And then you can imagine that if you combine checkpoint inhibitors with other anti-cancer drugs like targeted therapy, traditional chemotherapy, or even another checkpoint inhibitor, basically 
Um, the dermatologic world is your oyster. Almost anything can happen. We actually know from a study that CTLA-4 blockade with ipilimumab combined with nivolumab, which again is PD-1 blockade, actually can cause skin toxicity in up to 72% of patients who receive that combination. So just important to remember that once a patient's on a checkpoint inhibitor, anything can happen in the skin. So the other way to put this is that checkpoint inhibitors cause vitiligo, morbilliform, lichenoid, psoriasiform, vasculitis, everything under the sun. In other words, checkpoint inhibitors cause the field of dermatology. And this is really important for us to think about because almost everything's been reported. So we can't use morphology to identify a culprit. We really can't use morphology and hang our hat on it, um, hang our hat on it just because we're used to thinking that we're really good at the morphologic diagnosis. It's really important for us as dermatologists, as those, train, those of us training to become dermatologists, to really think about the fact that, you know, our uh, what we've been taught in terms of CPC is has its limitations, especially when it comes to checkpoint inhibitors, because um, we've shown time and time again that things can present in a very uncommon, atypical way. All right. So here, again, multiple factors here, host factors, of course, the patient's underlying malignancy, the patient's uh, environmental factors in terms of the type of checkpoint inhibitor that they're getting, whether or not they got prednisone to help treat this, whether they got whether or not they got another systemic medication to help treat this. It's really important for us to think about the fact that there are so many things that happen, unfortunately, that have to happen for our um, advanced malignancy patients, our cancer patients that really make it difficult um, to, to rely on a standard exam every single time we see them. All right, case seven, and I believe this is our last case. So um, case seven here on the dorsal hand, we see three lesions or four lesions, I should say, actually four, and then one that's off in the corner in the back that's kind of marked off and um, a little bit blurrier, but I'd highlight these four lesions right here. Um, but they all look like a pustule with this surrounding rim of erythema. And then on this one, you can start to see that they're starting to ulcerate a little bit and perhaps will eventually turn into a scab. Um, all right, so I think perhaps many of us here are expecting this case. It might've been tweeted that this case would be in there as well. So I apologize if I've spoiled the surprise. Um, that is a case of monkeypox. And this is obviously on everyone's mind right now, especially for me, because I'm in Massachusetts where the first case recently was, was kind of caught. Obviously there's a lot more cases of monkeypox at this point. Um, but I think it's important to think a little bit about monkeypox in general. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about monkeypox. So um, monkeypox uh, obviously has been around for decades. It is not a novel pathogen. This is something that has been seen in Africa. And there's those two variants in, um, and luckily the variant that has uh, seemed to surface here in the US is from the Western African variant that has a lower fatality rate, uh, estimated to be 1%. The important thing about um, monkeypox to think about is just that we have this prototypical um, clinical exam and story for what monkeypox looks like. But even so, most of us, I would hazard a guess, almost all of us who trained in dermatology in the last 10, 20 years have not really thought about how to diagnose monkeypox because it just wasn't seen so much in the United States. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, um, and I will, I will be the first to admit, I have not seen a case of monkeypox myself. This is just from reading about it and learning about it because I want to be prepared in case I have to diagnose or potentially diagnose a case of monkeypox. Um, what we usually see is, first of all, um, to know that the incubation period for monkeypox is quite long. The incubation period is five to 21 days. After that incubation period, you move to the, uh, the, the prodromal period where you start to have influenza-like illness or just basically a flu-like illness. You get fevers, you get headaches, you start to have arthralgias, myalgias, um, and then you start to get the cutaneous eruption about one to three days afterwards. Interestingly, the CDC reports that you actually get an enanthem first, so lesions in the mouth before the lesions might start to pop up on the skin. And then the classic, more common example, it's hard to say common, right, because this is already pretty rare for us, but in the more common example, monkeypox lesions actually start on the face, and then they start to move down your arms and then move to the palms and the soles. It tends to not necessarily accentuate the torso quite as much. 
And then it's importantly moves through multiple different primary morphologies. So when we think about primary lesions, about the macule, the papule, the plaque, the patch, the nodule, tumor, wheel, vesicle, bulla, all of those, monkeypox actually has four of them. So it starts with macules for one to two days after the rash starts. It converts to papules for one to two days, converts to vesicles for one to two days, and then finally it becomes a pustule for up to a week. And then after the pustular phase, it scabs up or crusts over, and then that can last for another one to two weeks. In terms of the transmissibility of monkeypox, like I mentioned, there's a long incubation period, but the good news is that it seems like this disease is not transmissible in the incubation period. You really should have some symptoms of disease before you're considered contagious. Um, but you can be contagious for that entire period of time that can last up to three weeks. So it's a pretty long time, which is why close contacts actually have to monitor their symptoms for 21 days as well because of that incubation period as well. And then what's important here is that even though this is already uncommon in the United States, the CDC recently reported that there are even more atypical presentations or uncommon presentations on top of that. And so recently um, they reported that there are now reports of monkeypox occurring or manifesting as a solitary lesion, often on the penis or the inguinal region. Um, and that, so it's important for us as dermatologists to keep that in the differential, especially if we see someone and we're thinking about a sexually transmitted infection. You know, I think it's really interesting for us as dermatologists because this, uh, unlike COVID, in this disease process, the dermatologic manifestations are front and center. And so I think our specialty really has a very special role here to play in potentially diagnosing early and helping to curb spread of this. The good news also is that spread is not as easy as in COVID. Spread is really primarily from um, close contact. Respiratory droplets um, and aerosols are theoretically are possible, which is why the CDC recommends good PPE and 95 eye protection. But really the most important thing is to make sure that you're wearing gloves. So just wanted to include this because I think it's on everyone's mind, um, but just to keep stay vigilant and to make sure that um, we're thinking about this, especially if um, the story doesn't fit. So really thinking about the fact that in monkeypox, what we're seeing is a rash start on the face and move down, as opposed to, for example, zoster or excuse me, chickenpox that usually starts on the torso and moves out. And then also thinking about the fact that in chickenpox, you have multiple lesions in various stages. In monkeypox, it seems that in, at each body part, as it moves, they all tend to be in a similar stage. This is just my point to say that sometimes it's just a zebra. As much as we want to say that, you know, if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, you know, sometimes you do get a zebra that walks in the door. But at the same time, though, I think it's really important for us to know that if we do hear hoofbeats, think about horses first. But if it doesn't fit your classic, your common presentation, that's why we're doing this talk. It's important for us to know the variations so that we're clued in to not miss a diagnosis, especially like in monkeypox when there may be some public health implications as well. So we kind of talked about this a little bit, but comparing monkeypox with other viral processes, one thing I didn't mention, lymphadenopathy is supposedly much more common in monkeypox when compared to things like smallpox, other pox viruses. You, like I mentioned, you can have multiple primary lesions in monkeypox as opposed to others. And then it's much more monomorphic, right? So all the lesions should be in the same stage for each body part, even though that it moves down from the face and it slowly changes, but they should roughly be in the same stage versus something like chicken pox, where you have multiple stages at any given time. We talked about the differences in distribution and spread. The last thing I'll mention is, again, I have not seen a case of this myself. But in terms of thinking about the lesions, we often think about herpes viruses, like clumping together, causing these herpetiform lesions. So up here on the upper right, you can see that's what we would call a herpetiform group of vesicles. Or if you want to get real fancy, you can call that an agmanit group of vesicles, this clustering of vesicles. Whereas at least in all the photos of monkeypox I've seen, they seem to be quite discreet. Now that said... I'm happy to defer to anyone who has seen a monkeypox patient if I am totally off base there, but just trying to prepare myself um, for, uh, I'm sure, the rule out monkeypox consults that we will get on the inpatient service. So to recap what we've talked about today, you know, to think about the factors that may alter how a skin disease might present. So there's host factors that include underlying skin tone, that might include immune status, that can include a patient's genetic differences. Uh, one that always comes to mind, perhaps just because of my own ancestry, are the HLA subtypes that put me at particular risk for severe cutaneous adverse reactions. 
Environmental factors are important to think about, such as occupational exposures. For example, we will regularly patch test dentists to different allergens because we know that they have very specific occupational exposures that the general public doesn't. Or lifestyle differences. What are the things you put on your skin? Do you go sun tanning? Do you not? Do you use a tanning booth? Hopefully not. Um, but it's important to think about all of those things when we're thinking about evaluating our patients. Geographic factors. There are differences in the rate of disease per capita. We all we we talked about the pemphigus belt in India. We talked about how there's more MF in the Scandinavian countries. Also, just thinking about the fact that as we all probably memorize from dermatology residency, Fogo Selvagem in Brazil, um, there are differences and different rates of disease in different geographic areas. And of course, climate is something that we need to think about as well, because as climate changes, we will also see a change in the distribution of a lot of our skin diseases. So it's important for us to really be thinking about that. And finally, the disease factor itself. Every disease is different. Every disease has multiple different ways to present. It's important for us to know them all, especially as dermatologists, if we're going to keep it on the differential appropriately. There are different subtypes of disease. And as I showed you with the example of mucosal involvement in bolus pemphigoid, you know, there are differences that come from environmental factors, host factors, um, different triggers that may cause like drugs or perineoplastic processes that may change how our disease actually presents. So in finally, I wanted to share kind of the quote unquote rules that I live by. These are the things that I often kind of come through my mind when I'm seeing a patient. Um, I tend to specialize in the more complex patient in term in the dermatology sphere. So I'm using these rules quite frequently. Um, but for example, in an immunosuppressed, immunocompromised patient, all bets are off. These patients will have a rash that just looks very banal, but can actually be quite severe. A great example of this is something that might just be molluscum in any other patient could actually be histoplasmosis or uh, coccidioidomycosis or cryptococcus in, in a patient that's immunocompromised. Immune checkpoint inhibitors cause all of dermatology. We've spent a lot of time on that, so I won't belabor the point. And then finally, I really wanna highlight the fact that I don't, I think it's important for us to, um, to say out loud that darker skin tones are not atypical. Like they are uh, patients with darker skin tones, just we just need to be better about understanding what that exam looks like. And we need to be trained and be ready to examine all comers who come to our clinic. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, this has been a blast to think about this um, and to put this PowerPoint together for all of you today. I um, really wanna th uh, thank Art for having me and to thank the Visual DX team for thinking of me for this talk. And also of course, thanks to the folks behind the scenes who are making this possible. And finally, a thank you to all of you who are attending this lecture as well. I think the fact that you're here speaks volumes about your commitment to really um, getting to be, to getting to improve yourselves on understanding all the variations that we have in skin disease. Stephen, thanks so much. You really touched on areas that are dear to our heart at Visual DX. And one of the key ideas is representative bias. This idea that in medicine, we teach them the classic and we expect people to memorize those classics and be diagnostic wizards from those classics. So at Visual DX, we've been trying to catalog the spectrum of disease and show you know, early versus late mild versus severe, and show all that variation in presentation. Wonderful, wonderful talk. And also the bringing this right up to date with monkeypox. Uh, public health is dear to our heart. Many are unaware that Visual DX really started at the time of anthrax in the mail. And we work for the CDC on smallpox vaccination adverse events. And during the interval, the last 20 years, we've seen a remarkable spectrum of new um, emerging and re-emerging infectious disease. And in fact, our work at Visual DX took us to doing family medicine grand rounds in Alaska, where we met the Alaskan family physician that discovered Alaska pox, another orthopox virus. And we have TANA pox in Visual DX and adverse reactions to smallpox vaccination. So wonderful talk. We, we have one question so far in, in the Slido, um, for those of us without a diverse patient panel, how can we improve our skills? That's a great question. Um, first of all, I think just to mention before I answer the question, Art, to your point, I was impressed with the, the depth of the Visual DX collection. When I asked if there were monkeypox 
photos, I was immediately told, yes, we have many. And so I think it's impressive that, you know, your platform has so many examples um, of even what we consider rare and uncommon diseases. Um, now, to get to the question in terms of how do the way I kind of hear that question is how do I improve my own skills for um, for diagnosing variants of uh, dermatologic disease, um, or perhaps in particular for uh, if my patient population is not the most diverse, how do I get that practice and how do I get that training? Um, so first of all, what I would say is I personally do not think that I am the best at this. I, I think it's important for me to acknowledge that I have a lot to learn. I think it's also important for all of us to acknowledge that we're all lifelong learners and we all have to work at this because skin disease will continue to change and skin disease will continue to present in uncommon ways, especially as climate changes, as population moves around, especially as things change in the world. Now that said, I think there are tangible things that we can all do, some things I've done, some things I wish I could do. The first is the fact that you're here listening to this talk, I think says a lot about your commitment to that. Um, so kudos to you. Um, but as I said before, I'm not the end all for that information. Um, there's a lot of other ways to really improve our knowledge. The second, I think, is, you know, just to point out that Visual DX, like Art said, has a lot of great represent representative photos. In fact, when I was putting this talk together, a lot of times I would just message the Visual DX folks and say, do you have a photo of this? And they would send it right along because um, they the, the depth of their library is, is quite impressive in terms of um, showing full representation of the disease spectrum, um, both in terms of variation, but also like Art mentioned in severity um, and time course. If you're a trainee, I think that there's a lot of opportunity out there. And this is where I'm a little bit jealous of my colleagues who are trainees. So the medical students can tap into lots of mentorship opportunities. For example, the American Academy of Dermatology has a mentorship um, program that you can apply to um, and that can help support a rotation in a different institution than yours, helps cover travel, helps cover the uh, um, basically the logistics for you to be able to rotate somewhere where you might see a more diverse patient population than your own. If you're a resident, um, similarly, the AED has travel grants um, that are available. And I'll just point out that a lot of institutions have their own travel grants as well. So uh, uh, I hope I'm not being too Harvard specific here, but I'll just share, for example, our institution has something called the VISTA program, where we take visiting um, residents from other institutions who want to come spend a month with us at Harvard, and then they get to kind of craft their own rotation and get a chance to see what our patient population looks like, understanding that ours may be quite different than other institutions. Um, and our institution will fund that particular person if they apply up to $4,000 for that travel grant. And we're only one. There are multiple out there. So I think taking advantage of those mentorship grants and travel grants is a great way to experience um, different populations. Um, and then just, I think the other thing is just always learning when you see your own patients and thinking about cataloging those patients, you know, in your own mind, um, but really thinking about cataloging those patients when you see them, um, just because that's how we're all going to learn just on the job quite frequently is, is how most of us as attendings learn, because we don't have the opportunity to do those travel grants quite as much. Um, that's, that's why I'd be jealous of the learners. Stephen, a couple more questions. When you're unsure of a diagnosis, how do you decide between treating empirically with a topical steroid or performing a biopsy, et cetera? Thank you very much. That's a great question. I think it depends on the, um, the possible disease entities that you have in your differential diagnosis. So what I mean by that is if someone comes in and I know, first of all, if I know that I take a biopsy and it's not going to change my management, I'm not going to do a biopsy. Because if I know that their rash is either eczema or it's, a, it's an eczematous dermatitis, but it's so mild that no matter what topical steroids is going to make it go away, I don't find the need to biopsy unless that biopsy is going to change what I do. So if, for example, I see someone with a plaque of rash and I'm worried that it's eczema or maybe it's, hopefully I'd be able to tell the difference, but for, let's say it's a very um, unusual presentation, I can't tell the difference between eczema and psoriasis, right? Generally, we can tell the difference, but if you can't, the idea of a biopsy would be super helpful in knowing what path you go down for therapy, because the treatments, the stronger treatments for eczema and psoriasis are quite different once you move past things like topical steroids and methotrexate. Um, additionally, I think the other thing that I think about is the stakes. What I mean by that is how bad of a diagnosis could this be that I'm missing? 
do I have time to wait to treat empirically? If I think that it's something that's going to um, be detrimental to this patient's health because I haven't figured out what it is, I'm much more likely to biopsy on that first visit. But if I think that I can treat this, make it better, and I'm not going to lose the potential to biopsy later, I'm not going to lose my yield, or I'm not going to lose time, um, then I might wait a little bit and see if we can just get things better um, with topical steroids. A couple other questions, Stephen. Uh, one was, thank you for raising awareness of presentations and diverse skin types. Does Visual DX have plans to include more dis dermoscopy photos in your library? I'll, I'll take that one quickly. Yep. We're, we're adding constantly new images to Visual DX, and we've been adding a lot of dermoscopy, not just of pigmented lesions, but you'll notice dermoscopy of scabies, one of our favorite diagnoses from the talk tonight that, you know, that's a great Thing to do is to look at a burrow with a der dermoscope and be able to see the mite. So yes, uh, many images coming of dermoscopy. And later this year, one of the presentations will be on dermoscopy in this series. Uh, another question, I may have missed it, but did you say if there's a confirmatory test for monkeypox or is it strictly clinical? You did not miss it. I didn't mention it. Thank you for the reminder. It is not strictly clinical. There is a confirmatory, a confirmatory test. It's a PCR test that's done on a swab, of, a swab of one of the actual pustules or vesicles. And so I think the most important thing for those of us who might see a monkeypox patient is to plan accordingly, meaning every single state is has their own state lab that might be able to run the confirmatory testing. Of course, the CDC can do it as well but the logistics in every state are different in terms of what tube to use, what medium, what swab to use. And so I think it's important for us to kind of be ready just in case someone comes in um, so you don't have to send them away. You can do that testing there. If you are practicing in an academic center, then certainly I'm sure your institution has come up with those policies and looked into it. If you're practicing more in a solo practice, private practice, I think this is a great time to either call the state lab to figure that out, or also a great time to partner with your academic institution nearby, um, just to see if there's an easy way to collaborate and uh, figure out a way to send samples, perhaps the academic center that can help facilitate that transfer of, of that test. Uh, one more question, are you using AI tools to aid in your differential diagnosis of skin diseases? And I guess I'll field that. There is a feature in Visual DX called Derm Expert, particularly helpful for non-dermatologists and the AI actually analyzes the lesion morphology in addition to supporting differential diagnosis. So we're covering hundreds of diseases by machine learning. It's really an approach of machine learning and AI guiding and teaching. We're not marketing or selling this as a diagnostic tool, but as a tool that really can help non-dermatologists do a better job at describing a rash. Um, I think we're about out of time and ready to move on. I want to thank Stephen again for a fantastic job. And this was all recorded. So um, anyone that missed part of this can watch the recording. Okay, so thanks for those questions. We're going to move on to the interactive quiz Kahoot. It's best to be done on two devices if possible. So keep this one open. Grab your phone or tablet and open up the Kahoot, and you can go to the URL that's on the screen there. And if you have the app, you can log into the app as well and put in the number that's up there, 854-4719, or take a picture of the QR code. We'll be giving out a $100 Amazon gift card to the winner of the Kahoot quiz. There's going to be seven questions. In the quiz, we did this last year. It's a lot of fun. And uh, we're going to be doing this during this series at other times. So I can't see how many people have loaded up as players yet. So we'll just give it a, another minute or two as people log in. There we go. Stephen, I love some of those cases that you put up, uh, particularly talking about scabies. I never heard the million mite uh, story of there were million mites in crusted scabies, but it is kind of the situation that will take down the nursing home or hospital and affect all the employees. <laughs> 
So it's really yeah. important not to miss crusted scabies. Yes, absolutely. One that we're always scared to miss for sure. As I'm watching this happen, I, I'm going to assume that I'm not allowed to play. So don't worry, I, I won't. I won't. <laughs> I won't log into the Kahoot quiz as well. I'm going to give it. Since people are still joining, I'm going to give it 30 more seconds, and we'll get going. There's also a question in, in the panel there about imagery of visual DX. And we really strive to show the spectrum of disease around the world. And we, we're particularly interested in medication reactions and infectious disease around the world. Um, I mentioned Alaska pox and Tana pox, and of course now monkey pox. But when you look at visual DX, we cover just about every infectious disease in depth and not only the dermatologic infectious diseases. And we're really working on this idea of bringing public health into the exam room. And so many of our users over the next year will notice that they'll see, start to see alerts and notices that are contextualized to their region. I know that we've already inserted into the University of Washington uh, version of Visual DX some links to the public health department in King County. And so we have this ability to really customize Visual DX and bring public health alerting and reporting right into the exam room. So let's go ahead and, and start the quiz. <laughs> 
Well, I want to congratulate Beverly Johnson for absolutely crushing it this evening in our Kahoot quiz. We'll be reaching out and sending you a $100 Amazon gift card. I want to wrap things up for this evening. And again, thank you to our sponsor, Janssen, for making this educational programming possible. Our master educational program continues next month on June 20th with dermatologic photography with Drs. Jeff Callen, Alona Frieden, and Dr. Kenneth Greer. Be sure to register. Now, this is going to be a great conversation. This special panel we put together are three experts in dermatologic photography that bridge the gap between film-based photography and digital photography. And those of us that photographed in our careers on Kodachromes, and remember Kodachromes, we witnessed the diminution and decrease in quality of dermatology photographs. So it's kind of paradoxical. We have many, many more photos in derm, but photographs in derm used to be better framed, in focus, better color balance than they are today. So this panel is going to explore how do we get back to higher quality derm photography and really care about our pictures for education and teaching and research. Also, for those in attendance today, we want to offer a special promotion for Visual DX. Many of you are completing residency soon, and if you're not going to an academic center that has Visual DX, you'll have to subscribe. So we put together a special discount code. You go to visualdx.com and you use Academy to get 20% off Visual DX if you have to subscribe starting July 1st. Remember the first 30 days are free. You always can uh, discontinue it. And you can use this both on the desktop and mobile device. So that concludes tonight's program. Really wanna thank everybody. Thank Jansen and J&J &J again for supporting this. And a particular shout out to Stephen who crushed it with a wonderful presentation. Really appreciate that presentation, Stephen. Thank you.